A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him. For he refresheth the soul of his masters. Welcome, everyone, to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm Willie Grills, here with Zelwyn Heidi, David Apple, and Adam Kuntz. It's another Conclave episode. Conclave 2, Word Fitly Boogaloo here, where we answer you, the people, we answer your questions. Now, we have a wide variety of questions, and we have, a, as wide as we get here at Word Fitly, a wide variety of guests, so we think you'll enjoy it. First things first, though, gentlemen, how's the weather? Uh, the weather is, I guess, normal. I haven't been paying attention to it t- too much, to be honest. <laughs> it was cool last week. It's hot this week. I've just been, <laughs> you've just been like de- like living under a fluorescent light in a blackened <laughs> room somewhere. There's been a lot of rain. It rains. It's like a, I almost feel like I've retired and gone to like Boca Raton. It's like yes, exactly. There's a, yes, there's an yes. afternoon rain shower that yes. is pretty predictable. You walk outside, you feel like you're in like some kind of a sauna. It's pretty good stuff. Right. Adam, how about in the Commonwealth? Yeah, pretty much. Probably not quite as humid, but yeah, I feel like I have moved to Florida without the tax benefits. So, <laughs> Zelwyn, have you hit 65 degrees yet? Oh, some days. Hey, there you go. <laughs> it's been a somewhat unusually cool June, so I don't know how my tomatoes are going to do so far, but we'll see how it goes. But then again, I also live, you know, in the Arctic Circle, so... But you do have a permit from the government of Canada to hunt seals at any time of year. So, I mean. <laughs> but you must, you can only use a boat oar or your bare knuckles. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know? As his ancestors did. What else would one right. use? Yeah. Zelda Gazable is made of seal skin. So. <laughs> if I wear one. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, you know, your Geneva, your seal skin Geneva gown was a little too hot this summer. So. <laughs> it is yeah. what it is. And of course, out here on the. Uh, Illinois Prairie, it's humid and rainy, but I think most of the crops are in. So, you know, thankful for the Lord's bounty, and we continue to pray for seasonable weather. Well, gentlemen, thank you all for agreeing to do another conclave. We will get Aaron Upoff back here. I I promise that. The listeners are demanding it. He will be here. He will be back soon, as soon as we find a suitable net or cage in which to trap him. Well, my my personal theory is that that was actually voice modulation by someone else. I don't actually believe in his existence necessarily. <laughs> yeah. I, I I have not been provided with any sure evidences of his existence. So that's that's where I'm at on that question. <laughs> Aaron is a sock account. Seems legit. I'm going with it. I might be the editor of this, but I don't think I can pull off that big of a deep fake yet, Adam. So well, what I want to know, I want to know what the opposite of ubiquity is, because we we confess we don't we don't know it, but we confess nullity. the ubiquity nullity. of Zelwyn. Okay, so the nullity of Aaron. Yeah, yeah, I, he probably is like a Nadia Boltz Weber sock account. So. <laughs> Well, all right, gentlemen. Speaking of Nadia Bowles Weber, here's our first question from the listeners. Beards. Now <laughs> <laughs> if you if you can't grow one, you shouldn't be ordained. Boom. Oh, now <laughs> right there. Although they can do a lot of things to chemistry today. So we gotta take it a little further. So a, a listener wants to know about beards. Ought we to have them? Is it Adiophora? For the New Testament church, what do you think? Ought men have beards? It makes you not a papist, so I guess there's, you got that going for you. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, there's no mandate in the Lutheran church that we must be clean shaven, as in as in the Western Rite Roman Catholic Church. But the the adiaphora question is kind of an odd one. I, I've never heard beards brought up as a potential issue of conscience within the Lutheran church either. So I'm a little nonplussed, but I would say, yeah, go for it or don't. Just don't go in between and just look like you're dirty and you forgot to shave. That, 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 that's, that's where I'm at. Listen, yeah. Listen. Yeah. You, you honestly believe with the state of confessional Lutheranism today that there isn't some parish somewhere demanding beard fellowship in some way? Well, look, I, what, Adam, what Adam just said has bound my conscience. And in a state of confession, I will uh, I will retain the five o'clock shadow until he takes back what he said. Yeah, well, that's just got your big Miami Vice fan, you know, going for that well, Sonny Crockett look. Also, those those Franconian genetics lend themselves to a five o'clock shadow. True. 
I, 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 I could maybe work in a 72 hour shadow if I didn't have a beard. It's not really a problem for me. Yeah. I, I was born with a beard. So yeah, it's not even, I can't not, <laughs> can't not have something going on. So the point is men probably, you know, I'm just saying, I'm not saying you have to grow a beard, but you'd, you'd be cooler if you did. Is it, this is an issue though for the Eastern Orthodox, right? Well, yeah, I, I think generally there you you can only be clean shaven if you have a medical prohibition, as I understand, in most okay. of the Eastern churches. Yeah, because ancient tradition says that it's a uh, kind of pagan and gay to be clean shaven. <laughs> to use the technical term, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you know, it just gets too visceral when you use the historic terms from those from that era, right? I think this is some kind of signal among Eastern Orthodox clergy, because sort of the equivalent of their kind of liberal 1970s guys, especially in the OCA, will right. sometimes be completely clean shaven. Exactly. And they'll yeah. wear Western style clericals. So yeah, you'll, yeah, you'll see Western style clericals. You you know, if they do have a beard, you'll it'll be like some kind of like really uh, sculpted goatee, which is yeah. always a disturbing thing to see. <laughs> And so, so yeah, so hey, folks, if you want to grow a beard, grow a beard. It's a good sign of manliness. <laughs> Don't let anyone bind your conscience, though, I suppose. But, you know, probably have some facial hair. I'm waiting for 19th century mustaches to make a return. But unironically, the hipsters took the mustache from us, and we need to take it back. You heard That's it here it. first. You heard it here first. <laughs> but now, but they're, coming, they're coming for the beard now, too, because the, uh, mm. like you said, the well you know, the well-groomed goatee is is an odd look, but the well-manicured and the oiled beard, like that's, I see that yeah, every Oiled time. beard and a craft IPA or whatever it is they're drinking, yeah. you know. We need to have a long national conversation about this. Just grow a French fork and there'll be no issues. <laughs> there we go. So Zelwyn, definitely a proponent of the beard. Is your <laughs> beard, do you grow a beard for medical purposes or is there some sort of, is it for the North Dakota winter or is it due to the Old Testament commanding that you not trim it? It is quite nice to have a beard in the uh, North Dakota winters, so I'll give it that. There we go. <laughs> so, all right. So, enough about beards then. A listener wanted to know a bit about the history of the liturgy in the Lutheran Church. Now, we can't, we could do episode after episode on that. So, let's talk about it a little bit here. Onwards and upwards, eh? <laughs> <laughs> there is an idea that the high church liturgy as it looks today was somehow a return to the way it was at some point in history. The reality is that the liturgy in the Lutheran Church is very much dependent upon time and region, and it, that's that's just the simple fact. Do you guys think there's ever been great uniformity in world Lutheranism? We could say regional, yes, but what about world Lutheranism? No, I don't think so. I mean, the further north you went, the more you retained, but then even as you get as far south as like Württemberg, they had almost entirely abandoned it, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, it's it really is just a regional thing. To, to say that, you know, we're trying to come back to some kind of unified tradition that all the church had is, I don't, it's just not historical. Yeah, the closest you get is the actual form of the liturgy. And I'm using, you know, this kind of broadly too, with vestments in mind as well. The order of service could be rather consistent, just depending but again, you, you see these variations that come up. It's easy enough to go and look at historic orders of service. That's where it becomes difficult. You know, then this is really where the question of adiaphora comes in. And the original definition is, what can I do without offending my conscience? Not everything's okay, so I can do it. You know, what, what do we do with that? Let's take our own synod, for example. For, let's say, Walter gets here, what does the typical vestment look like? Uh, what does the what does the liturgy look like? Let's say for the Saxons. I think that Zelwyn knows probably more than I do about that. But the thing that I'm unclear on with the Saxons in the Missouri Synod is that their liturgical intentions differ from what they end up practicing. Yeah, and that's where that's where I'm going with this, which is that they they intend to wear vestments which much more closely resemble a lot of what goes on in the Missouri Synod today. What I myself wear, which would be a chasuble, a stole, an alb, a cassock, and they're probably more often doing the talar, which is not the same thing as a Geneva gown, but it's a large black garment with the preaching bands or befshin. They're probably doing that much more often than anyone is wearing a chasuble, an alb, and, and so forth. 
And there are various reasons for that historically. And there is a liturgical renaissance, if you want to look at it that way, in Lutheranism in Germany and Scandinavia in the 19th century. But not all of that gets transferred practically to any one place in particular, much less America, where often you're basically working with whatever vestments and paraments and so forth you have available to you. And as the general rule, you tended to see more elaborate ceremony and vestments in urban parishes than you did yeah. in many rural yep. parishes. That, yep. that was the rule in, in Europe as well. Today becomes a little tricky. Our liturgical renewal in the 20th century, what would you date that to? Is it fair to say the 60s, maybe even into the 50s when you start to see it with guys like Peep Corn and others? Although the theological allegiances of the high church crowd at that time are different than, than the high church crowd today, it's all very complicated. And that's always been kind of the interesting thing. It, this is true in Lutheranism. It's true in Anglicanism these days. You know, the vestments you wear, whether right or wrong, people perceive a certain theological viewpoint from the way you dress and conduct the liturgy. Yeah, I, w- I want to say also about the liturgical renewal or renaissance in the 20th century is that it has in Lutheranism a variety of streams. So someone like Arthur Carl Peepcorn is sourcing his desire for a change in liturgical practice, uh, what he would call a higher standard in liturgical practice, from his research into the history of Lutheranism. That is the same impulse that in the late 19th century among the Eastern Lutherans produced what we now know as the common service or divine service right, three. Right, right. Page 15, if you will. Page 15, yeah. This desire to find the best from the period of Lutheran orthodoxy and to bring it back into practice or however you want to look at that. But I would say that the the other the other thing that really enters into American Lutheranism in the 20th century is this Anglican description of high church Right. As a theological affiliation, Lutherans historically, because we are a confessional church, had varieties of, let's say, levels of ceremony between, you know, Zellin mentioned the, the South, the Germans, the Southwestern Germans had a very, a simpler liturgical tradition than the Saxons or the Swedes. The issue in Lutheranism was never about the amount of ceremony. It was always about doctrine and practice. Now, obviously that has ceremonial implications, but levels of ceremony, like do you chant or not chant, were not seen to be necessarily theologically important in Lutheranism. The way in Anglicanism, they have always indicated utterly different theologies, right? If you're chanting, that means that you're definitely not a Calvinist. If you're not chanting, and if you're wearing like a minimum of vestments, that means that you're definitely not an Arminian. In Anglicanism, high church should not indicate anything theologically in Lutheranism, although at this point, probably it practically it does. Yeah, right, right, right. And I think it's been that way since the 20th century renewal. I mean, yep. frankly, that's that's when it happens. I, you didn't see guys warring so much over this in the 19th century, even though you would have rather stark differences, in investments and things like that. Yes. Um, I'm sure somebody will write in with an exception to that. But, you know, in general, that's the way it is. Couldn't you argue, though, that like with the page 15 and stuff like that and trying to come back to some sort of pure stream, aren't they cobbling together of, from a variety of sources something that is, they think is kind of representative of them all? I think the best way to look at the common service is as I think it is common. I think to see it as some kind of historically pristine thing is silly unless you're dating it from the 1880s. Right. It truly is theologically Lutheran, but heavily, heavily, heavily influenced in its language by Anglicanism. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a debt to common prayer. I mean, even even not just the the common service, but even some of the prayers that we use and the colleagues right. and everything. Right. So. As is any, any English-speaking form of Protestant Christianity is going to be influenced by the Book of Common Prayer. I mean, our our marriage service is largely taken from it. So, right. And it's it, what's interesting about the common service is that it's produced between the faculties of Gettysburg and Philadelphia, which at that time are different church bodies. But when the English Synod produces a hymnal before joining the Missouri Synod and becoming the English district, they just 
pick up the common service and run with it. So it is probably the most widespread thing in American Lutheranism, but I think it's most helpful to see the common service as a common liturgical heritage of American Lutherans broadly, rather than as a continuous product of Lutheranism from Reformation times onward, however much resemblance it may bear to European liturgies. That shouldn't be a black pill. I mean, that does mean it's kind of uniquely ours. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah. So one last question that should get us up to the break. One of the questions is about CFW Walther on the duties of the church, but let's pack that a little bit more broadly. What do you see as the duties of a church in general, in a succinct way? What what should a church be doing? What has the Lord called us to do? Well, you can look in the book of Acts, and you can get the at the very end of Acts chapter 2, you have the, are there four things listed there? The first disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So obviously the the preservation of apostolic teaching and preaching is first and foremost. Then what comes next to the fellowship, which I, I believe is usually, I guess there's some discrepancy as to what that means, but I what I've always taken it to be is the common offering, the common charity that's going on in the church, which is described after Acts 2 verse 42. Then you have the breaking of the bread, the Lord's Supper, and then finally the, what's the last one? The prayers. So worship. And I mean, if you if you have those four components, I think that that's probably as succinct in the New Testament as you're going to get. Preaching, caring for one another, mercy and charity, the sacramental life of the church, and common worship. There we go. So that's what the church does. She goes out you know, that's actually internal, but well, she goes out and she preaches and she teaches. Yeah, she does the things that the Lord commands. So the church is about gathering around the word and sacrament, receiving the forgiveness of sins, you know, even fellowship, we could say. Do you think that the church should necessarily be evangelistic? <laughs> that's a no from me. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't appear to be important to the apostles, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus didn't say much about it, you know, especially not as he was leaving. Listen, go ye is speaking in the way of the law, gents. So, you know, we don't really want to, <laughs> we don't really want to, you know, he didn't really mean for us to do that. That's a bad translation, Will. You were going with a bad translation. <laughs> That's right. I need to, need to brush up on my Greek. Then I would really see that Jesus only told us to go into all the world so that we would feel bad about not going into all the world. Like what I'm saying with referencing the Acts passage, like that's that's very succinct. And there's obviously going to be broader things that are going to come out of that. I mean, the the main mission of the church is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You do that in a variety of ways, but that's that's always got to be at the center of the church's life. Very good. All right, folks, we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Visit our website, wordfitlyspoken.org. There you'll find new articles each week on the Bible and other topics. You can also join us on Facebook at WordFitlyPosting. That's WordFitlyPosting with a P to discuss anything you've read or heard. Thank you for listening. We'll be right back with more WordFitly Spoken. Welcome back. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grills, Zellwin Heidi, Adam Kuntz, David Apple, talking about anything and everything here on the second conclave. A lot of good stuff in the first segment. And right out of the gate, another good and interesting question about prohibition. How did the Lutherans view American prohibition? Is alcohol consumption essential to the Lutheran faith? And how can one live as a Lutheran without drinking? Let's tackle those one by one. Gentlemen, what was the Lutheran response at the time of the Prohibition? 
It depends on which Lutherans you're talking about. If you're talking about the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which had a massive proportion of 19th century German immigrants in cities, which is really the source of the American brewing industry in the 1920s, the Missouri Synod was called and did not deny that it was the wettest denomination in America because even the Roman Catholics had some kind of minor prohibition faction within them that thought that prohibition was a good idea legally. The Missouri Synod did not. The Missouri Synod was also fairly uniformly democratic in the 1920s, which people would need to know a little bit about the part, the history of the political parties in America. But we, the Missouri Synod was decidedly anti-prohibition. Other American Lutherans were divided on the political importance of the question or the political wisdom of prohibition. Lutherans obviously theologically have no objection to the moderate consumption of alcohol. Drunkenness is a sin. Consumption of alcohol per se is not a sin, but it is possible to be a Lutheran without consuming alcohol straightforwardly. (laughs) (laughs) And this is a question going to any of you. Do you ever feel a little bit uncomfortable with this kind of reveling in in like alcohol and tobacco and other things? Not that there are sins to partake of them, but my question really is if a Lutheran smokes a cigar or has a whiskey and doesn't take a picture of it and distribute it to social media, did it actually happen? <laughs> yeah, well, that that's kind of the interesting Zen question, I think, about social media and maybe a question too deep for myself. But I, I would say that consumption of different kinds of alcohol or or tobacco or whatever is I, I think that people really need to understand that this is kind of a cultural peculiarity. It's not like this in every place and time. And so to be like, well, this is what Lutherans do is sort of like saying, well, all Lutherans love beer and brats, you know, and it's it, it's just kind of a it's kind of a strange thing to say if you're trying to reach people who are not descended from 19th century German immigrants. Right. The world the world isn't Wisconsin. Correct. Or Minnesota, especially the urban areas where you have these – that culture still really thrives in those parts. Sure. And we have it in pockets throughout all of the all of America. But, you know, stereotypes are there for a reason. So that's where these enclaves are. And they do tend to – yeah, I mean, it's beer and brats are seen as some kind of Lutheran identifiers. Right. So I, there probably is some pressure to drink and to smoke and to do things like that. Again, it, it's fine, but don't think your orthodoxy is in question if you decide not to drink. Because, you know, drinking and smoking, two separate things, but and we're just focusing on the drinking. Drinking can quickly lead to excess. The Bible does admonish us to be careful with that. Paul is going to say not to be drunk with wine because it leads to debauchery, or I believe it literally just says is debauchery. But the Bible will also say, you know, wine makes glad the heart. Right. Again, yeah. it comes back to this idea of avoiding drunkenness. And that sounds easy enough, but light drinking can quickly lead to inebriation if we're not careful. I think it's fairly common in, con- I know my congregation has a policy. I don't know if it's an official policy or just one that gets mentioned of not like at our potlucks or things, There, there is no consumption of alcohol. And so there's a recognition that some, I mean, why does that exist? There must have been a time where something got out of hand and everyone was, or at least enough people were kind of incensed by that and said that we can't do that. You know, we don't want to put a stumbling block in front of somebody who does have a problem with alcoholism or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, it's like Ephesians 5, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, instead be filled with the Holy Spirit, seems to be the opposite of let's roll out a keg for every semi-special occasion. (laughs) And again, it's not passing judgment on those who do, it's simply to say, let's take a step back from reveling in this, and also maybe think about the witness. We we flip this on its head a little bit, like let's say a, a Baptist, like the Southern Baptist Church, which by and large frowns upon the consumption of alcohol. Some have interpreted that to mean they're the weaker brother, and therefore I need to drink to show them what the true gospel is. And that's not really how the principle of the weaker brother works. I'm not so sure it's wise to use something as, you know, inconsequential as, as alcohol, you know, to just simply to trigger someone or, or to prove something about your freedom in the gospel, which is something we see time and time again. I understand where the guys are coming from. You you see this person who believes that it's an actual sin to consume any alcohol. So you want to 
to to teach them better. So you're going to take your meat sacrifice to idols and let them know what it is and eat it in front of them to play on Paul's usage there. Do you think that's the, the right way to go about that, gentlemen, or, or how would you handle that situation? Well, it's it's neither what Paul does, nor is it really persuasive to people. Bingo. Paul Paul wants people to bear in mind the weaker brother because the goal in what you're doing is to edify the church. It is not to do whatever you want as some kind of marker of your freedom, even if you are truly free in it, in the same way that Paul foregoes his right to make his living by the gospel when he's making tents in order to support himself so that he doesn't have to burden the young churches with the cost of supporting a minister. It's also something like if you're dealing with somebody who truly believes that drinking in and of itself is a sin, then a badge of Lutheran identity should actually be something theological instead of a just kind of your your cultural predilection, right? It should be something like your under your clear understanding of justification by faith or the election of grace or the nature of the sacraments, right? Let let your identity be theologically grounded and culturally flexible rather than something that really is truly culturally specific. I mean, my my congregation doesn't have a policy against alcohol because no one would ever think to serve it at a social function where children are, where I live. That's just the culture, right? That's, sure. that's just the way right, it goes. Right. That's okay. It's not a big deal, right? Our identity and the thing that unites us across any region or culture is our theology. And so run with your theology and you don't have to offend someone whose conscience is ill-informed or very weak by doing something that's just going to upset him, right? You're not, you know, the, the weaker brother is to be dealt with, with care and and respect for the fact that he he also belongs to Christ, even though he's very poorly informed about what that means practically. Right. We need to sort of stop this theology of triggering or this theology of snark that we've kind of developed when it comes, especially when it comes to these kinds of things. People need a gentle hand. Often they need a, uh, and, and a clear explanation of, of what the Bible teaches. And we, but we actually have to make sure they'll listen to us. <laughs> and so just completely shutting them down immediately over something as unimportant as that, as unimportant as how high uh, alcohol content is, is sinful or not, it, you know, again, maybe not the best way to do it. All right, guys, moving on then, you know, we touch one third rail. Can there be two third rails? Let's, let's dig into the nature of sin, specifically mortal and venial sins. What does the Lutheran church have to say about those? The concept, obviously, of mortal and venial sin is coming out of Roman Catholic theology, where the distinction makes a, a fairly large difference as of, you know, in, in terms of how you deal with it and how you deal with it in terms of penance or if you're able to deal with it in terms of penance. Whereas I think in terms of Lutheranism, I would still say that there is some truth to it because some sins are going to affect us in greater ways than other sins. It's borrowing language to talk about the reality of sin. I mean, it's it's kind of like Paul saying that sexual sins affect the body in a far deeper way than any other sin, and that's why we should be especially careful to avoid them. Well, you have Walter making the distinction, too, between mortal and venial, but having a sin with faith and a sin apart from faith, I believe is how it's phrased. Is that right? I, I'm not sure. I, I, that sounds right, but... <laughs> we'll go with it, which which is uh, admittedly some confusing language there. But that's really the heart of the question, though. Are there worse sins than others? We would agree that all sin leads to damnation, but there are certain sins that are worse it's kind of become a platitude or a cliche that all sin is sin. And what people mean by that is they're all the same in severity, but the Bible does not present the case that way, which is what Zelwyn's saying. I, I think it's in the, in the small called articles and it's in one of Luther. It's either there or in the large catechism. He talks about open and manifest sin, which drives out the Holy spirit. Right. And I believe he uses the example of David It's either Saul or David that he uses the example of biblically. You know, he doesn't simply say all sin. So there's a distinction between open manifest sin and what, I don't know what the flip side of that would be, but something done in ignorance or without the same intention, right? And I think that that's where we we don't say like, there's these categories of sins that if you commit them, these are the mortal ones. And then there's these sins, which no matter what you're doing, 
if you do these ones, these are just venial. So any sin could potentially become mortal if you want to use those categories, if it is embraced by the Christian. Right. I, I do think for our context today, mortal and venial just becomes kind of really more confusing than helpful because it is so associated with Rome's doctrine. You know, suffice it to say, all sin needs to be repented of, even the sin that we don't realize we committed. And we'll actually get into sins of ignorance in a little bit, too. You know, we're certainly not going to do as Rome does and make out lists, you know, murder over here, mortal. Right. Saying a bad word at the card game, venial. So, you know, you need di- different solutions for different for different sins. Yeah, it just becomes kind of a, a non-helpful distinction for a lot, simply because it, it, it confuses people. So when we do use them, if we choose to, we have to be very careful about how we explain them. But I don't even know if this distinction comes up in most of our catechism classes. I mean, do, do you present sin that way to your confirmands or catechumens? No, I teach original or inherited sin and then actual sin as right. the fruit of original sin. Yeah, there you go. Just like the Bible does. It, well, you know where it comes up is in First John. It comes up when you if you're doing a Bible class on First John, because there you have sins that lead to death. Right. And ones that don't, apparently. And again, there there are worse sins. But then is the question of what sins harden you, as Zelwyn's saying, the sexual sins. Paul presents the case where they seem to do worse internal damage. I mean, that's that's the question of, of to what degree does sin affect us? What is the remedy for that? Which, of course, we know, word and sacrament. But yeah, we, we tend to think of, of sinning in, in much of Lutheranism as just something transactional. So I sin, that means there's a debt to my account, I need to have that debt paid. We forget of the actual temporal and spiritual consequences of sin. And not just the spiritual consequence of judgment, but the spiritual consequence of hardening of, of the heart yeah, right. and what that does. That's why we should really be on guard. So much of our discussion, as I said, just revolves around only the transactional notion. And we, we, we lose out on a full-orbed spirituality that way. That the sins you commit do take a toll on you, spiritually and oftentimes physically. That's reason enough to avoid them, never mind the fact that it's sinning against Almighty God. And of course, though, we know that when we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And we will move on into the next question. This one probably is going to spill over into the next segment. So we talked about something like prohibition. We went on into mortal versus venial sins. Well, now let's talk about punishment or reward according to sins or good works. Let's talk about the concept of degrees of glory. Does the Bible teach it? Do the confessions affirm that this will happen? Gentlemen, what do you think? Yes, the Bible teaches it. Paul is especially clear on this when he discusses rewards for believers. You get this in 1 Corinthians 3.8. He says, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. You also have the notion in 2 Corinthians 9 that he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I think the reason that people are a little allergic to the idea, although they will find it in Luther and Francis Pieper and also in the Confessions, which I, I, I know, I think Willie has something on that. The reason they're kind of allergic to it is because the notion of works having anything to do with eternal life seems counterintuitive to a lot of Lutherans, understandably. But because these rewards are not connected to justification, you have no reason to worry about it. It's also something that, that, that that scripture teaches us. Yeah, the Confessions quotes from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, uh, whereby we read, also citing Paul, we teach that good works are meritorious, not for the remission of sins, for grace or justification, for these we obtain only by faith, but for other rewards, bodily and spiritual, in this life and after this life, because Paul says, 1 Corinthians 3, 8, every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. There will therefore be different rewards according to different labors, but the remission of sins is alike and equal to all, just as Christ is one, and is offered freely to all who believe that for Christ's sake their sins are remitted. Again, we can Paul post more, Romans 2, he basically says the same thing. Parables of our Lord Jesus Christ that speak to this. But I understand why people get nervous about it, and I think that it's from uh, good intentions. They don't want to obscure what we consider the chief article, that of justification by grace alone through faith alone. Nevertheless, we cannot ignore uh, what Scripture clearly teaches. Again, I think we're, we're a little bit conditioned still these many centuries later by Roman Catholic theology 
or some kind of idea of I'm doing good works for the sole purpose of meriting something. And that's not really the case for good works. Good works are just the natural things that Christians do by virtue of being Christians. What would be an example of a good work a Christian would do that the Lord would smile on? Well, something that we talked about earlier would be the notion of proclaiming the gospel that is actually filed as one of the sacrifices of thanksgiving in the apology that Christians do. The proclamation of the gospel is a sacrifice of that person's time and energy and and heart to talk about the Lord and his work with somebody else. And you, you get this idea at a glance in Daniel 12 where a promise is made, and this is this is certainly in the Lutheran tradition, always applied to the office of the ministry, Daniel 12, 3, that those who lead many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. So that, that promise is applied to the one who is proclaiming the gospel in the same way that, you know, Isaiah denominates the messenger of good news as one whose feet are beautiful upon the mountains. So I think that, I think that when you're thinking about degrees of glory, you shouldn't think of it as like, some kind of illegitimate promotion or, you know, the kind of... Re- <laughs> right, it's a subway card. Right. You know, you, you, know you, you get enough punches, you get a free sandwich. Yeah, right. It, it, it's it's always because of the labor that that person has done in the Lord for which he is rewarded. And there's a helpful distinction systematically between degrees of bliss and degrees of glory, whereby our old dogmaticians say that there is a difference in degrees of glory in the life of the world to come, but there is no difference among the saints in the degree of bliss that we have in the Lord. So it's not as if, you know, I, I mean, I, I can tell you very easily, like I will rank lower than Peter in the life of the world to come. I'm not an apostle. Okay, so that does, that's not going to make me resentful of Peter in the life of the world to come. Right, and this is a good, re- this is why you should still be reading old books, I mean, among many, many benefits of them, but the older books did not shy away from these things the way sometimes we do. They just presented the facts as they were. So the old systematicians, for example, things like that, they're just they're just good for you. And last couple of minutes on this, since we have degrees of glory in heaven, what do we do with hell? The scriptures also clearly present degrees of torment, or however you want to put it, Yeah, that yeah. the one who does what is wrong and does it in his innocence is going to receive a lighter punishment than the one who does what is wrong in full knowledge that it is wrong. So the the one who sins against the law, knowing the law, becomes guilty, guiltier than the one who never knew the law and yet was still guilty before the law, which is, of course is Romans language. I think it's as clear as day. Well, very good. We got to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Hang tight. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly. Welcome back to Word Fitly. This is the Conclave answering listener questions. So really good discussion thus far, guys. Really enjoyed it. Let's continue right along. One listener wants to know about the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 38 to 42. And that reads, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. 
Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so the question has to do with a Christian and his rights. Is it ever okay for a Christian to stand up for his, for himself or herself and demand his rights? Or must a Christian simply accept any wrongdoing that comes to them and just live with it? What do you guys think in light of this, in light of these verses? The issue with people standing up for themselves as far as that being a spiritual danger is that one's own sense of righteousness is very easily conflated with one's anger, bitterness, resentment, rage, such that it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to tell the difference between your rage and what is actually the case or should be done. The anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. So something what Jesus is warning against is a reactive position in the world, which would require you in every given circumstance to react in a vengeful manner when you are injured or wounded or stolen from whatever the case may be. And thereby he's opening up the full extent of the spiritual sense of the fifth commandment by explaining what it means truly to care for somebody, especially someone who has hurt you. That's a different question from the concept of self-defense or defense of the neighbor, let's say one's family, whereby you are not doing anyone any good and you are unambiguously allowing harm to be done to yourself or your family by, let's say, you know, letting someone letting a robber murder you on the street. That's not going to do anybody any good if you refuse to fight him off. Right. Well, you're actually breaking the commandment, thou shalt not kill in that way. You're you're denying <laughs> right. the positive implications there. You are to protect life. And especially in the case of a father who has a, a family to protect, it is your it is your duty to do that. I don't think the Lord's going to smile on you for just ignoring them. The same way as if you're considered a bad father if you don't support and feed your family. What kind of a father wouldn't do what was necessary to protect his brood? Now, you might fail at it, but at least you tried. It's it's a greater tragedy to not even attempt a defense. So so you're coming out against John Piper? Is that what you're saying, Willie? Well, I don't want to get the desiring God lawyers after us. No, yeah. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So John Piper makes this statement of, paraphrasing, if someone broke into your house to harm your family, what would you do? And he basically says, I I don't know. Well, John, if your answer is anything other than I would do whatever was necessary to protect the family that God has given me, the wife and children that in his providence he has given me to love and to care for, then I think you need to revisit your exegesis, frankly. I understand the, the purely pacifistic position, but at the same time, I do think it's an error. That's not to say that, that you put on a two sizes too small tap out t-shirt and carry around your Terran tactical or open carry your Terran tactical Glock around and just, just looking, looking to use it or you watch Death Wish 50 times and want to recreate it. That's not the idea here. But a Christian man is prepared and any man ought to be prepared to some degree for a would be attacker, uh, whatever that looks like. If only for this reason that God has made you a protector of your family. And so you should you should be mindful of that. Again, I'm not saying I'm not saying go buy a you know a Sig MPX and leave it by the door necessarily, or even a baseball bat or something like that. But just the general principle of being willing to defend these good things that God has made you a steward of. Well, I mean, I think that 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 gets kind of right to the. I think one of the root issues with a misunderstanding of these verses is that comes in when you when you view yourself as being just this pure isolated individual which if that were the case then you could presumably turn the other cheek in every yeah. situation but that's not the reality of of how God has created us and and so you know you're bringing up the position of fatherhood or you can even sometimes see this like with well I I don't like the way that people in political office deal with other deal with one another. Well, sometimes you have to be aggressive in those offices. And I, and I don't think that it's just flat out sinful. You know, you're not violating Matthew 538. I mean, you might you might be 
overly angry or rude, but it's not wrong to defend yourself or to defend those who God has put you in position to defend. Yeah. Now the legal question becomes tricky. I don't mean the like standard ground laws, but literally the question of lawsuits and things like that in general. Jesus says, if someone would sue you and take your tunic to give him your cloak as well, we do live in an overly litigious society, but the New Testament certainly has something to say about Christians and lawsuits, specifically Christians and other Christians. What what does the Bible say about that? It's a loss. You've already lost. That's the First Corinthians six passage. Is that if you can't, if you haven't figured out how to figure these things out amongst yourselves, that's already counted as a loss to you. Don't you know that you will judge the angels? Right now. Do you think that that means that a Christian can never sue another Christian? Because this is this is how the question's framed. Can a Christian fight for their rights, whatever that looks like? And a lawsuit would typically be that way. I believe I've been wronged. I'm going after what's mine. But it was a fellow Christian who harmed me. In light of Paul's admonishments, what can a Christian? How can a Christian understand those verses? And what should they do? I think that I think that you should avoid any kind of legal proceedings, and that it should be pursued in and through the church. Like, I don't think it's wrong for you to say, look, I'm owed this, or, you know, this person has wronged me. But that, especially if it's between two Christians, then that is handled in the church through the, you know, the various ways that the church has set up to handle these things. I I think in default of a judicial process, which some church bodies don't don't have that and our own church body's judicial process is not really designed to be strictly speaking judicial anymore. Everything is handled as an interpersonal difference in dispute resolution. I, I think that it's somewhat similar to a question about divorce. Should two Christians get a divorce from one another? Well, the the problem is that one of those people simply is not the Christian. And that would be the person who in the divorce is the guilty party or the person who in the lawsuit is wronging the person and is utterly unrepentant about it. So I can see redress to courts in the sense that court actually has the power of equity to enforce judgments and punishments on the offending party, which the church doesn't possess. I mean, we can't, we can't seize people's assets. And in that case, then at least the innocent party may have some means of redress the other person would have to be dealt with by the church in terms, I think, of excommunication. But I think it is very similar to the case of a of a divorce where they may both claim to be Christians, but by the nature of the case, one of them cannot be. So it's a question of being wise as serpents and innocent as doves, using our reason here when we come into these things, I'm not falling, say, into the Mennonite error of just accepting you know, any any harm that comes your way. But at the same time, again, you're not just looking, you're not a billboard lawyer, you know, or something like that, just looking for a case to, to make and not just asserting rights when there aren't rights. So, and I, I suppose that would be a helpful discussion for another time. Is there a difference between God-given rights and state-sanctioned rights? And what do we do with that? But maybe the next conclave, we'll tackle that one. So, the next question, and again, if we don't get to it this episode, maybe we'll get to your all the questions in, in future episodes, so be sure to keep tuning in. So this next question has to do with sinning against conscience and sinning in ignorance. So it's really a few questions. When does a pastor know to preach against certain sins? Is it okay to hold off on preaching against certain things? Or is refusing to preach against certain sins just an excuse to gloss it over? And if you never address certain sins, is that reducing the severity of sin or is it somehow indirectly condoning sin? So let's let's take a look at that. When do you know to preach against certain sins? And do you think it's ever wise to wait? Or let's even let's not even say preaching against, but but confront them. Maybe, you know, maybe you're not preaching from a pulpit, maybe you're preaching directly one on one to someone in counseling or a private meeting. When do you know to actually confront these things. Ponderous, isn't it? Well, it's not It's not an easy question, no matter how you slice it. I mean, because you're dealing with the the reality of sin, in, and maybe there are times in which prudence would demand that I, you know, put off talking about this at least for a time. 
if we're using that as an excuse to say, well, I'll get to it later, but I never get around to actually talking about it, that is also a problem. But a, a zeal without knowledge might lead us to actually speak too harshly. I don't, I don't know how to put it. In, in our zeal to set everything right, we may actually end up causing more harm than good. You know what I mean? But that's but that again, you don't want to use that as an excuse for ne- for not talking about it. It's just where where does wisdom come into this? In and is it well? I don't know. What do you guys think? Is it wise to wait at least for a time? I think it just en- entirely depends on the person you're talking to or the congregation you're dealing with. I would be reluctant to say that it is cowardice in someone in a utterly different situation to not address something in the manner or at the speed at which I would do it in a different context. And I'm not, I'm not saying that at all to get out of having to address something. It's simply the nature of pastoral work is context specific because you're dealing with people. So in the same sense that, you know, dealing with three human bodies that each of which has cancer They might have cancer originating in a different cell. It might be at different sizes. It might represent different threats to their lives more or less immediately. You could have three different surgeons who are all working on the same, you know, they're all working on cancer, but because it's in three different bodies with three different types of cancer, they're not going to work with the exact same treatment plan, all three of them. So I think that when you're dealing with any kind of question, the abstract question of is this sin or not is usually fairly clear cut. The question of the speed at which you deal with something is going to depend on the present need. Is the person asking you directly, is what I'm doing wrong? You're not authorized to lie, but you're also not required to deal with every single problem that you know of in a congregation at a certain speed, because that, as Zawin said, that may just destroy everything. So you will end up completely vindicated, utterly right, completely correct, all your ducks in a row, and you have destroyed the congregation in the process. Well, I think part of the original question too, and this kind of gets back to what we were talking about with degrees of punishment earlier in the episode, the question also had to do if, if by leaving them in a state of ignorance, which I kind of find difficult to believe except maybe in you know in theory only but if you leave them in in ignorance doesn't that in a sense reduce the the severity of the sin reduce the trespass because when the law comes in that actually increases the trespass and so you're kind of inflaming the situation just by addressing it well that yeah i mean that that is true i mean you have to keep in mind two different things in this case one is the stern warning in ezekiel that If you are aware of sin and you do not warn the man who is in the sin, his blood is on your head. But if you warn him and and still he does not repent, then his blood is on his own head. So there is a responsibility to warn where sin is present, just generally, right? But the other reality is that when you are dealing with naming sin for what it is, it makes sin exceedingly sinful, right? The preaching of the law is a giant magnifying glass on sin, or, you know, it's it's like if you turn on fluorescent lights when you're looking in the bathroom mirror instead of the nice, you know, incandescent bulbs, you, you're, you know, you're, you just look a lot more awful under that fluorescent light or under that magnifying glass. And that's what preaching does. That's why it makes people uncomfortable because you're putting names to things that they just kind of let slide or didn't think about during the daytime. And I don't think Jesus himself would say, oh, let's just leave them in a state of ignorance because then right. it'll be better for them. Right. That That's that's really, that's just kind of like saying, okay, you're still going to go to hell, but at least you won't be in the <laughs> deepest part of hell. You'll, you'll feel yeah. good. You'll feel good before you get there and you'll be very surprised that it actually exists. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's an important point to bring out that like, even when a person is in what we're calling ignorance, they are still culpable. Right. So ignorance right. does not mean innocence. It just means that they they're not sinning in a way that they're they're not like sinning against the knowledge that this is sin. That's what you're saying, right, Adam, that it makes sin exceedingly sinful. Right. Right. Because once you once you tell me, you know, from God's word, this is what you're doing is sinful. Now I can't 
I can't plead like some kind of, well, you know, at my old job, we did this all the time. <laughs> and that, and that is, that, that's also a reason when you are doing something to think about what kind of legacy you're leaving within a congregation. Because when pastors make utterly opposite decisions about the permissibility of a fourth marriage or something, people are extremely confused and justifiably so. And it's it's a little much for the shepherds to expect the sheep to figure it all out, especially when the shepherds themselves don't agree. So consistency in pastoral practice is also sure. really important in this case because it makes everyone's job that much harder when, you know, let's say uh, your predecessor simply just let people do whatever they wanted for the sake of getting along socially in the congregation. That that never ends well because it's not it's not like sins just evaporate when one pastor, you know, lets that fourth marriage go ahead and then he's gone and then suddenly the next guy is stuck with dealing with all the massive massive and predictable fallout of somebody's fourth marriage, you know, and not not Abraham Kalov fourth marriage where, you know, he just had all these <laughs> wives die, right? Most American fourth marriages have three divorces bef- uh, preceding them. So just because you're letting something slide doesn't mean that you're not going to have to deal with it in the future or someone else won't have to deal with it in the future. Basically, you're committing yourself to a treatment plan as a pastor, but the speed and the precise means by which you treat something are not prescribed to you. And that is why pastoral practice is an art and not a science. Very good. Well, guys, thank you very much for coming on and doing another conclave with us. Always enjoy you, the listeners, as well. And any question you, that you happen to have for the next one we do, go ahead and start sending them in to us. You know how to reach us. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Always a pleasure to have you guys. This has been a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard and want to know more, check us out, wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or Twitter at wordfitly. On behalf of the entire WFS crew, God love you and God bless.